Network infrastructure and design, network models, the OSI model. So we're going to discuss two different models coming up here. And the first model I want to talk about is the OSI model in this module. Now from this lesson, you're going to have a thorough understanding of each of the layers in this module. And there are seven of them. Uh, and we're also going to talk about how those layers communicate, some of the devices that operate at specific layers, specifically layers one through three and some of the protocols that operate on some of these layers as well, specifically the upper layers. We're also going to have a better understanding of what the OSI model is and why we use a layered approach. So this model is going to teach us everything we need to know about the OSI model. We're going to begin by explaining exactly what the OSI model is and what the purpose of it is as well. Then we're going to go through and explain each layer, from layer one, the physical layer, to layer two, the data link layer, layer three, the network layer, layer four, transport layer, layer five, the session layer, layer six, the presentation layer, and finally layer seven, the application layer. We're also going to discuss some of the protocols and devices that operate at each of these layers, and we're also going to understand how communication begins and ends uh, through these layers. Now. Early back in the 1980s, late 70s, when networking and communication between devices, which a lot of simpler, a lot of brilliant individuals from the ISO, uh, organization we've seen previously, or the International Organization for Standardization, came together and they came up with a, a, a way to outline, standardize, and uh, uh, characterize the functions of a communication system or the methods by which computers are going to communicate in a network environment. So they came up with this OSI model, and I love it because I know the ISO made the OSI. And they did this in terms of abstract layers. So what we mean by these abstract layers, and here they are, again, from the top down, application, presentation, session, transport, layer, data link, physical. And just so we don't get confused, um, the first layer is actually here at the bottom, and the last layer is here at the top. And that, and viewing this, we call this a top down approach as opposed to a bottom-up approach and these abstract layers outline the functions of the communications process but they hide exactly specifically how they're implemented in each layer in other words this really attempts to simplify and sometimes oversimplify exactly how everything in the network is communicated so let's say that we want to establish a highway more so, we really want to build a brand new type of vehicle designed specifically to be driven on this very specific highway. And we're going to have to do it from the ground up. So let's call this vehicle a bus. Not only do we want this bus to be able to run on any of the existing highways that are out there, but we also want the bus to be able to use the already existing bus stations as well. So in order to do this, we need to understand exactly what we already have meaning what the standards are already in place for a highway. We also need to know everything about bus stations and everything about the infrastructure of the highway system that already exists. Regardless of whether we actually have to build the highway, we still need to understand everything that relates to highways and their designs, uh, to the materials, the limitations, and so on. So this way, when we're designing our brand new bus, we can ensure that it still can drive and operate on older highways, not to mention new highways, and that our bus is going to interact uh, properly with the other buses and other vehicles that are on the road. The other benefit here is if I'm designing this bus and I break it down into different layers, seven of them, I only have to worry about one part. For instance, there might be someone who is responsible for, say, the wheels. And there might be someone else who is responsible for, uh, say, the body. And there might be someone else who's responsible for the highway and someone else who's responsible for the bus stop and so on and so forth. This way I can fragment everything out and give everyone specific jobs. And if a problem occurs with the bus, then I can go to the specific person with whom, uh, who is most familiar with that section or that layer. This is the benefit to a layered approach to creating something. So that being said, let's talk about the very first layer, layer one. So layer one is the physical layer. 
This is the actual physical media, the cables, the wires. This is the means by which the bits go from one point to another. So for the actual cable, uh, it, the infrared connection, the radio frequency, even Wi-Fi, all of these reference the layer or the pathway that the data is going to take. So to take a look in this in the way that we were talking about it with our bus and our highway setting, if our main concern is building our buses, we need to look at all of the other vehicles on the road. We need to understand their size, their shape, uh, other characteristics, and so on. So that way we understand how our bus can use the same tracks the other vehicles are using. So here on layer one, we have the path, the road used for communication. Again, this is the wire, uh, the Bluetooth, fiber, copper, the Wi-Fi, whatever means there is that physically the bits, the ones and zeros, are going over this media. So the terminology for the information is considered simply the bits because we're actually transmitting the raw one and ones and zeros. We're not dealing here with what the information is. We're dealing with it at the most electrical, uh, basic sort of s standpoint. So this is simply the, me the media, and this is called physical. And as you can imagine, this is also the very first place that data is going to enter into the computer, right? It goes over the cord and into a NIC, all right? Now, what happens then? Well, then we get to layer two, which is called the data link layer. An easy way to remember that the layer two is data link is because it's the only one that has two words. It also has, and this is not as important uh, for this, uh, uh, for the Network Plus exam, but it's still good to know, there are two what we call sublayers, the MAC sublayer and the LLC sublayer. This layer in total, and so these two make up this data link layer and this layer as a whole is responsible for allowing devices to share the same medium the medium being the physical layer so here we see a few things happening first we see a certain level of error correction and error detection on the physical layer we're going to see this a little more on later layers as well also and probably more important we see access control which I've denoted here, and I'll get to this in a minute, by the stoplight. So this function is performed by this MAC sublayer. Again, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But the most important thing here is that we have physical addressing, or the MAC address. So anything that looks at MAC addressing, and by the way, MAC addressing is oddly enough performed by uh, the LLC layer, allows a device to look at a certain extra uh, layer of information. So, whereas with layer one we saw physical, if you remember we talked about hubs, hubs just forward bits, they don't look at the bits. So they're gonna operate at layer one. Here at layer two, we start dealing with MAC addresses. As a result, this is where devices like switches are found. And that's why switches are often called layer two devices. There are more advanced types of switches, but I want you to remember, again, a switch is a layer two device. Now, if we look at this in a slightly different way, here is where we have to be able to have access control on our highway. So this is where we have to be able to have uh, proper on-ramps that are only going to allow authorized vehicles to enter onto the road. And we also need to establish standards for how the road is going to be uh, used by everyone, perhaps with signs. And here we also need to remember, this is where we establish how everyone is going to share the road, who's going to access the road, and uh, a certain level of checking for damage on the highway and vehicles. For instance, people sort of going on and making sure there aren't potholes. In this layer, we refer to the data as frames of data because they're beginning to get framed. We're no longer just dealing with the ones and zeros. We're dealing with them in a frame or in a uh, sort of larger context. Now the next layer is layer three or the network layer. Here's where a really a lot of exciting stuff happens. Okay. First, the third layer is different from the second layer in that the data link layer transfers data between devices that are within the same network. Okay. So if you remember, we dealt with dealing with switches. Switches only deal with devices on the same network. 
But here on layer three, the network layer can allow us to transfer data to and from devices that are on different networks. It does this by a specific kind of addressing, specifically IP addressing. And when we deal with IP addressing or the internet protocol, we allow it's called routing. So the main job of the network layer is really about this routing. It's about routing and routers. So knowing this and that IP addresses are used for routing, we come to the conclusion that the kinds of devices we're really going to find in this layer are routers. So routers are what we call layer three devices. And that's what you're going to see on the test. Now for the information to actually reach the destination, this IP address has to be mapped to a physical address on layer two. So the protocol that does this is called ARP. What ARP does is it maps for better, for a lack of a better way of describing it, maps MAC addresses to IP addresses. By the way, ARP stands for address resolution protocol. This protocol actually operates slightly on the network layer and slightly on the data link layer because obviously it's dealing with MAC addresses and IP addresses. Now it's important that you consider that remember we talked about UDP versus TCP UDP being connection less and TCP being connection oriented. That's when we're dealing with ports and we'll talk about that more. We talked about that in A plus and we'll talk about that a little more later. Well, everything in the network layer is connection less. This means that it manages the transfer of data in a connection less uh, mode. It just sends the data, but it's not going to wait for a reply to ensure it got to its destination. This means we're sort of using a best effort here. This is like dropping something in the mail and just hoping it gets there. We're not using certified mail at all. On layer three, the information, remember layer two we had frames, well now we have something called datagrams. So this is, now we're moving up right we had frames now the frames are packaged into datagrams so if we keep with our method of talking about the bus metaphor okay from the third layer up we're going to concentrate on the bus itself so we've been talking about the road right we talked about the road itself the physical layer and then we talked about how people are going to share that road which is layer two the data link layer now layer three the network layer this is the bus itself Layer three through seven concentrates on the processes that affect this container, in our case, the bus. Since we're basically designing our bus, this layer is determining the best path that our data is going to take. So in a manner of speaking, this is like uh, the bus driver on a specific route, who's gonna be constantly updating us with routing information. So it's saying, here's our first destination, here's our second destination, here's our third destination. Just in case a route is blocked or if there's a faster or better route available, layer three is where those protocols are going to operate to find the shortest and most reliable path to our destination. Here on the fourth layer, also called the transport layer, some crucial functions are taking place. Now one of these functions is reliability. It can be said that the TCP protocol, what you might have heard uh, in TCP IP, if IP was on the layer three, perhaps, then layer four is TCP, uh, the TCP portion, operates on this layer, or at least close enough to the transport layer to be considered a layer four protocol. Uh, just a sort of uh, secondary side note, and we'll talk about TCP and IP a little bit more in depth in the next module. They have their own model. The OSI model is sort of a theoretical model. It was never actually implemented as it was created. That being said, we still use it in discussing a lot of stuff, which is why we need to talk about it. So the reliability is guaranteed by, in here, the connection-oriented 
protocols that are on layer four. So the transport layer has mechanisms that keep track of uh, these segments. And when segments fail, the transport layer resends them. There's also this acknowledgement feature, such as a, like a certified letter would have, that ensures that when a message is received by the destination, the transport layer is notified, for instance, by a message received successfully, what we call a ACK packet or acknowledgement packet. Besides these guaranteed delivery features, we also have what's called data flow control. This function ensures that during the data transfer, the receiving end doesn't get flooded with too much data at any one time. Later in the lesson, we're going to talk about different data flow te techniques and flow control techniques that are used. Now, the transport layer is where something else called sequencing of data occurs. Basically, when data is transmitted, it's either broken apart or fragmented to be able to send it across the medium. And when it's fragmented, each fragment or piece is labeled with a specific number. So that when the receiving end receives, uh, when the receiving end of the transport layer receives this data, it can be reassembled and put back together in the proper order. This is really important, especially when data is received out of order, as I just demonstrated. Now, in essence, this layer is much like the standards and the laws that we have in place on our highways. They ensure that vehicles get us to where we need to be safely and on time. Now, some of the other protocols you may have heard of that operate on this layer are SCTP, uh, some tunneling protocols, and uh, more importantly, here when data is sort of partitioned out, it's called a segment, as opposed to uh, a datagram or a frame. Now, the next layer is, uh, I think it's one of the easier ones to memorize. It's called the session layer, and layer five. And it's pretty simple because the sole purpose of this layer is to establish, maintain, when it comes time to shut down uh, or conclude the communication session. Now, while the OSI model assigns the responsibility of this termination of sessions, uh, to the session layer. Some other models have performed this on a different layer, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. Some of the protocols you might see on here are, for instance, RPC, which stands for Remote Procedure Call, uh, and uh, TLS and SSL uh, as well. So this layer manages how and for how long and in what way a device is going to establish a connection. During the communications process, if the layer is not yet completed with its functions, the rest of the network just has to wait. So in keeping with the analogy of the bus, and in order to understand how the session layer fits in, let's take a look at exactly why we're using our buses. Is it for transporting people, or is it for transporting uh, top-secret documents from the main office building to the remote office? This why is going to determine several things for this layer, right? If it's determined that we need um, several connections to take a private highway, for instance, it might be determined that we need a, a private bus to take... Um, special documents uh, to maintain security or take a special highway, for instance. So the session layer is what's responsible for determining what type of data and how we need to connect this session. Continuing on to the next layer is the presentation layer, or layer 6. This layer is responsible for taking the data from the application layer, which is the next layer we'll talk about, and translating it into an intermediary language that the rest of the network can understand. And it's also going to perform it in reverse on the receiving end. Also in this layer, data encryption and compression takes place, sometimes called the syntax layer because of its data encryption abilities as well as its conversion to a network relatable format or a format that applications can understand. Now, what this really means is because the applications is going to have its own syntax or its own language, the presentation layer is going to try to map between those languages. Now, if the mapping is available, then the presentation layer is going to convert the data into data units for the session protocol. And after that, it's sent down the stack, down the rest of the layers to do everything else it needs to do. Now, some of the protocols that operate this layer are um, 
anything that's dealing with compression, for instance, uh, PNG, uh, JPEGs, TIFF, a lot of these sort of um, picture file extensions that you've seen. This layer also performs code conversions. They're going to take raw application data and compress them into more manageable forms for transmitting. Now regarding the translation capabilities of this layer, think of like two different systems that are very different from each other. One perhaps using TCP IP, which we know, and another using IPX, SPX, which uh, don't worry about, but it's another sort of protocol suite. This layer is what makes communications available. Because of this, we also know that a gateway device, if you recall from the devices we've talked about, is a device that's going to operate on this layer because it's converting between two different types of networks. This is the biggest difference between a gateway and a router, which, as you recall, operates on layer 3. A transceiver, by the way, and you remember a transceiver is that uh, device that is on a NIC. It's going to allow you to talk, for instance, between a copper and fiber network. Also might work on this presentation layer depending on how we define it. Other people might actually say it works on a physical layer. Now to put this layer in perspective, the presentation layer is like having a double-decker bus with a tour guide on a microphone who's translating everything that can be seen and heard to the passengers. The tour guide is also going to help repack the tourist's luggage for them, which is like uh, compression. And it's also going to add another level of security for VIP passengers who might come on board. This is just like encryption. Here, the formatting is simply making sure that the passengers are briefed and ready for their tour and making sure that they, or the data, is ready for the application. So again, we're really packaging this up for presentation to the application layer. And the terminology for data at this point is going to be actually called data. So this is where we're moving up in the world. We're no longer talking about segments or datagrams or frames. We're here now talking about data. It's packaged in a way that an application can read it. Finally, at the topmost layer, we have the application layer. This is the layer that's closest to the user. And it's the only one that the typical end user is going to be interacting with. Now, even though it's called the application layer, this doesn't mean that the application itself is on this layer, uh, but that the application layer provides utilities and services that an application could use for accessing network resources, like some of these that we've talked about. SMTP, which allows you to get email. DNS, which is going to translate between an IP address and a fully qualified domain name. FTP, which is going to allow for file transferring, NTP, Network Time Protocol, which is going to keep time up to date, and HTTP, which allows us to browse. So, for example, let's say you have a file that you'd like to transfer to a remote computer, right? What method are you going to use? FTP. Now, the application layer provides the FTP services to the application you use, which is some sort of FTP client. The FTP client itself does not exist on the application layer. Simply, the protocol does. This layer is the one you've probably dealt with the most, and you're probably likely already familiar with without even realizing it. For example, you utilize this layer every time you check your email, browse, etc., and so on. Now, some of these might not fit perfectly into the application layer, and that's because, again, this is a theoretical model. When we talk about the TCP IP model next, it, we'll see this working in a lot more of a practical way. Now, because we all know we have many different applications on every one of our computers, one of the purpose of the application layer is to regulate the communications between these applications and manage when they request services and resources. So while it might seem easy to lump all applications together when talking about this layer, the only applications that this layer is actually going to manage are those that have a communications component. So, Solitaire would not qualify for this, right? But Internet Explorer, which has all of those browsing and protocols, FTP, DNS, etc., is going to uh, deal with this. So this layer is also responsible for network access, a certain level of error recovery, 
And it's also capable of some data flow measures. There's a lot of redundancy here. As this is the seventh and the final layer, this is where the information or process either starts or finishes. So an application is going to create what it needs to be sent here and then unwrap the data once it's sent uh, from one computer to the next. So to finish off our analogy of the bus, um, this is sort of like the bus station. Here's where all the people wait in line to get tickets to use the bus. They're going to dictate, the bus station is going to dictate who has access to the resources, the resources being these buses. And it's going to receive all the incoming drop-offs and process them, as well as control the flow of people in and out of the station. And it's going to notify people if there are problems on the highways and so on. Just as users are typically mostly going to interact with the application layer, the bus riders are really only going to interact at the bus station layer. Right? They're not going to be interacting with mechanics of building the bus or maintaining the bus or dispatching individuals or any of that stuff. In most cases, they're not even going to be interacting with the individual driving the bus. So this is really where users are going to be doing most of their interacting. Now, after going through each of these layers, we can now begin to have an understanding on how they're grouped together. For instance, layers 5, 6, and 7 are what we call application support blocks. When we look at each of these layers individually, we can very easily see that the functions of each play a very specific role in the application management support and keeping them consistent. The remaining four layers, from the transport layer down to the physical layer, are what we call the network support block. These layers and the protocols and devices that operate on them are all network related whether it's for routing or switching on the network or ensuring data delivery on the network and so on. Uh, perhaps even making sure that the actual bits, all the way down to those bits of data being communicated. Now as technicians and specifically for the exam, you really want to know which layer relates to which support blocks. And also this is going to help a great deal when we discuss the next networking model, which is the TCP IP layer model. So uh, just to sort of go through this again, we start here at the application layer and we work our way down until we get down to the physical layer which is where the data can actually be transmitted over the network and then it builds its way back up until we get to the last application. So if I'm browsing, uh, let's say this is me, right, and this is a web sort of server I send a request, the request goes down all the way, goes over the network, it might even hit a couple routers along the way, or switches rather. So we're hitting some switches, and then we hit some routers, and then we hit some switches, and then it's going to go all the way up again to the web server, and then the web server is going to send that data back, etc. And so we go, this really follows on each end how data is being sent and received. So before we wrap this up, there's a couple ways to remember these, and I'd really highly recommend committing this OSI model to memory. There's two ways we do this. One is called the top-down approach. This starts with layer 7 and ends with layer one. Now the reason you want to just remember whichever mnemonic device I'm about to tell you, just remember which one you're remembering so that way you know how to write it. A great way to remember this one is all people seem to need delicious pizza. Uh, now again, all is application starts at seven. So we're starting with the user and we're going down to physical to the hardware. Now the other way I like to remember this is uh, please do not throw sausage pizza away. That's my particular favorite. Now here we're taking a bottom up approach because we're going from the bottom up. So realize that this, you're starting with the physical layer and going up to the application layer. So however, which one of, the, one of these you memorize, you use to memorize this, uh, just remember to commit it to memory, and when you get to your exam, write it down immediately so you can just look at it. And remember, this is 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This is where hubs would function. 
Again, uh, they're just forwarding the same information, just like this is where a cable would function. Data link is where most switches are going to function. And on the network layer, that's where we're going to see routers function. This is the most information that I see on the exam. And so if you commit this to memory, I think you'll be set. Okay, so just to recap one last time and review everything we've discussed. First, we explained the history and the purpose of the OSI model. Remember, the important thing to realize here is that it's a layered model. And the reason it's layered is to make it easier not only to uh, develop things for each layer, instead of having to develop something for the entire system, I can just develop one little device, such as a router or a switch. And also, it's going to be easier to troubleshoot and fix anything that goes wrong. We then talked about layer one, the physical layer. Right, and this is uh, where chords, for instance, the media exists, and where all the bits are going to go from one place to the other. We're really here dealing with the ones and zeros, the electrical bits. Also, remember, hubs exist here as well. We then talked about the data link layer. This also had two sublayers Mac and LLC. And this is where we see MAC addressing or physical addresses start to occur. And that means that here is where we're really going to deal with switches. The data here, by the way, is, call, is put into what we call frames instead of just dealing with bits. Now, the next layer is the network layer. And this is where uh, we start to see routing. And this is thanks to a new addressing system. Specifically, the one we're going to see the most is IP addressing. This means here is where we're going to start seeing routers. And don't forget here, we see start seeing uh, terminology for packets. And the one we mentioned too was datagrams. We also mentioned that this is where we see connectionless or connections that don't sort of have uh, a definite got sent or delivery receipt. We then looked at layer four, which is where we see TCP from the IP suite, right? And this is the one that's gonna start looking at guaranteeing our delivery. Layer four is also where we ensure reliability and flow control. Here, information is called segments. When we get to layer five or the session layer, we see that we're really establishing and maintaining a session. This is where we're gonna start and gracefully end our communications, such as SSL communications. When we get to layer six, this is where encryption and compression occur. This is also where we start seeing the term data. Finally, we talked about the application layer, or layer seven. This is the layer that's closest to the user. And this is where you're really gonna see the interaction. This is where we saw a lot of the stuff, um, such as SMTP, FTP, HTTP, and so on. This really governs everything. So if we go back through this with our metaphor, remember the physical layer are the highways, the data link layer are how we're gonna share the roads. Remember we st thought about a stoplight. The network layer is where we start determining the best route to get from one place to the other. The transport layer tells us, for instance, the rules of the road. The session layer is what type of highway we might need to take. For instance, I might need to take a, um, a special private highway if I have important documents. The presentation layer is like the bus driver.
who is going to pack up our bags for us and also communicate and make sure that we know where we're going. And the application layer is going to be like the bus stop. Now the OSI model is in actuality pretty obsolete, but we need to understand the theory behind it before we can get into something that's a little more um, uh, necessary. For instance, the TCPIP layer model.